the St. Mark community for your awarding me with their scholarship. I'm going to York College of Pennsylvania for mechanical engineering next year. And the two things that I will miss the most and I love the most about St. Mark is that we really are a community. We're more of a family than I've heard or seen any other churches be or become. So hopefully I'll find that next year out in York for while I'm out there, but if not, I always know I'll be able to come home to St. Mark. Um, and the second thing that I will miss the most about St. Mark is probably volunteering for groups like BBS and helping out at youth group. So again, thank you for giving me this scholarship. Hello, my name is Katie Silver. I will be attending the Science College in the fall. Uh, two things I love about St. Mark are its welcoming atmosphere and kind and supportive members. And I would like to take this time to thank the congregation for this scholarship offer. Uh, my name is Jackie Trimmerton. I will be attending Rome University in the fall for music industry. Two things I love most about St. Mark are being involved in building concerts and then playing in youth parade events. I'd like to thank the St. Mark congregation for the scholarship. Hi, my name is Katie Hammond. I will be attending Penn State University in the fall. The two main things I like about St. Mark are the people and the institution that we love on. Welcome. We would hope that you are giving at home and will sing along with us. Our first song, our opening song, is Cornerstone. So, would you join us singing us uh, with us? The words will be up on the screen.
Lord, is if, if it is you, calm our fears. Take heart. Do not be afraid. For God is here. Lord, if it is you, please bid us come. Come, reach out. For God is near at hand. Lord, if it is you, increase our faith. Walk with strength. Dismiss life's storms. And hold the hand of grace. Please join us in singing, I am. We expect to really hear you, and in the sanctuary, because I know a lot of the youth like the song, so sing nice and loud. Now we join our hearts and voices in that prayer Jesus taught disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in singing the great hymn, Standing on the Promises. We'll be singing three verses.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew, the 14th chapter. I'll be reading from verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they, then they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's the kind of joke that people tell their pastor. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. A real groaner. A rabbi, a priest, and a United Methodist pastor were fishing on a lake not far from shore. The rabbi used up all his bait, noticing a bait store not far away. He stepped out of the boat walked across the water, and purchased fresh bait. Returning to the boat, walking on the water, he started fishing again. A short time later, the priest did the same. He ran out of bait, walked across the water, went to the bait store, came back, walked across the water, got back into the boat. The Methodist asked him not to be outdone. When he ran out of bait, he proceeded to step out of the boat and he sank. When the pastor emerged, the rabbi and priest said, Hey, dummy, don't you know where the rocks are? <laughs> I, I told you it was a groaner. <laughs> This was an instruction that normally was given to me in days prior to cell phones. We'd go to the mall and Cindy would come and say to me, Do you guys go ahead. I'll catch up with you. I would go into panic mode. Where are you going to catch up to me? How long will it take you to catch up to me? And how many of these crazy kids are you going to leave with me until you catch up with me? You're not leaving them with me, are you? Oh, you're going to catch up with me because I'm going to sit on that bench until you're done. When I finally came to understand Cindy needed some time alone, we've come to a compromise. Okay, you have 45 minutes, you'll meet me in the food court, I'll be the one bribing the children with french fries. In our scripture lesson, Jesus compels, forces the disciples to get into the boat and set out from the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
Jesus promises that he'll catch up with them. But there's no promise where Jesus would catch up or how long it would take him to catch up. But Jesus was insistent. Despite having to disperse a crowd that could be as many as 10,000 people or more, Jesus sends the disciples ahead so that he would have time to pray. Early in chapter 14, we are told of the beheading of John the Baptist. In response, Jesus gets in a boat with the disciples to head off to a secret place where they could pray together. But when word got out, a multitude gathered to see Jesus. Jesus encountered the crowd and had compassion. He placed his agenda aside. He healed all that were sick that day. The disciples remind Jesus it's time for the evening meal and the crowds needed to be dismissed to get food in nearby villages. Instead, five loaves and two fish fed the 5,000 men in addition to the women and the children. Jesus sends disciples ahead. So he might have time for prayer. While we're not given the content of Jesus' prayer here, we can imagine Jesus praying for John and his family. You can imagine Jesus praying for that which awaited him in days to come. And I can also imagine Jesus praying for the disciples. I, I can imagine him praying for the disciples because before AccuWeather and more accurate than Glenn Hurricane Schwartz, Jesus knew there was a storm of coming. Storms, violent storms, were not unusual on the Sea of Galilee. Before the storms occur, Jesus is praying. In verse 23, we are told, when evening came, Jesus was there alone. If you remember Genesis last week, we were told Jacob was left alone. Jesus reminds us here that we don't have to wait for the storm in order to pray. We don't have to wait for our kids to have difficulty in their marriages for us to pray for them and their marriages. We, we don't have to wait for our grandchildren to be tempted by drugs to pray that they not be tempted by drugs. We don't have to wait for victims of terror. You just fill in the blank with each and every week. We don't have to wait for challenges that will happen to the church. We can pray before the storm. I remember a Christian friend from seminary who always spoke of being prayed up. By so doing, he meant that he had an ongoing prayer life with God, that when the storms came, prayer was as natural as breathing. Was Jesus here praying up and letting us know that we can pray before life's storms? And while Jesus is praying, the disciples are struggling with the storm. The waves were battering the boat. They were far from land and the wind was blowing against them. But despite this meteorological nightmare, the disciples 
don't cry out in fear until they see what seems to be a ghost walking towards them on the water. Jesus assures them that it is him. While there's no mention of prayer in the boat, I can't help but believe that in the midst of the chaos, someone thought about seeking God's aid. I know that most of the disciples were experienced fishermen, but surely there were land lovers like me with nothing else to do but pray. Maybe everyone was so intent and engaged on keeping the boat afloat that they didn't even think of prayer while they were in the midst of storm. Is it possible that Jesus was praying for them and they were not praying for themselves? I'm not very good at prayer. Now that scandalizes you until I add for myself. I'm not very good at praying or myself. I'm much more likely to pray for others, for the church, for situations in the world, for my family. I depend upon you to intercede for me in the storm. And you can depend on me to pray you through. Over the last few weeks as I've begun radiation therapy, I have been encouraged and strengthened by the thoughts and prayers of this church family. In the midst of the storm, I've been assured that you have been faithful in praying for me when I have at times not been able to pray for myself. Some of the youngest members of the church family have sent me colored pictures. I, I'm not sure they always get things right, but I love their colored pictures. One of the little ones sent me a picture, and it said, get well. And then it had Jesus in the tomb, and had next to it three days. Now, that made me a little, because um, I know God hears the prayer of children. <laughs> the idea of me being in that grave for three days, uh, I, I think he's got, got to work on that a little bit. Their parents and their grandparents have sent me beautiful sentiments, both serious and humorous. At times, we need to pray for those who are going through the storm until they're able to pray for themselves. The only mention of prayer in the midst of the storm is when Peter decides that he wants to do what Jesus does, that he wants to be where Jesus is. And in faith, he follows Christ's bidding and steps out of the boat. He experiences walking on water until he loses his focus, until his attention is diverted, until he sees the wind rather than the one who calms the storm. And as he begins to sink, he prays a three-word prayer. Lord, save me. Sort of like the old cartoon where Wiley e. Coyote runs off the cliff and he keeps running for a few more steps until he realizes there's no ground below him. He gulps and drops like a rock. Now, we hear Jesus' words to Peter as derisive. You of little faith, why did you doubt? But then we remember... This is the very same Jesus 
who said if your faith is as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. At least Peter had a little faith. In the words of the book by John Ortberg a number of years ago, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. I, I guess if it's all in perspective, Peter was the only disciple who was willing to get out of the boat. I'd be cowered in the corner of the boat with multiple life preservers tied to the boat to make sure the wind and wave are not going to carry me away. Or maybe, more likely, I would have refused to get into the boat in the first place and instead called for an Uber. Jesus and Peter get into the boat. The wind ceases and the disciples worship him alone, declaring truly, you are the Son of God. After the storm, the disciples pray and offer worship to Jesus because he had brought them through the storm. So much of the feeling in this story centers around fear, but after the storm, fear turns to faith. Now, we might think that it's easy to pray when the storm passes over, but that's not always true. Think of the story of the ten lepers and the one who returns. The disciples could have turned in, in indignation to Jesus and declared, Don't do that again! Or, Next time, we're not going ahead and waiting for you to catch up. Or, was that necessary, Jesus, really? But the greatness of the disciples is that they choose to turn to God in worship. In faith, they believe that for whatever reason that only God knows, the storm must have been necessary. They declare together, truly, you are the Son of God. The old hymn lyric speaks to us. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Day by day, his sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, follow me. As of old, the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake. Turn from home and toil and kindred, leaving all for Jesus' sake. Jesus calls us by thy mercies. Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. What is God saying to us in this scripture? Before the storms of life, during the storms of life, after the storms of life are over, God calls us to pray. Most gracious and glorious God, in all circumstances of life, you call us to trust you to be in a relationship with you that involves a steady time of prayer in the good times, in the hard times, and in the times in which we've just made it through. We don't understand all of the issues with storms of life, but we know that we will constantly face those storms. This day we ask that you give us strength to hold on to you and faith to declare truly you are the Son of God. Lord, this day we would lift up those who 
are in need of your presence, particularly in these days. We pray for our sister Joyce, who's lost her son this week. We continue to pray for Nancy, who's had a fall. We pray for those who find themselves out of work and those for whom hope is more memory than reality. Lord, we lift up those who this morning aren't real sure they've got a reason to get out of bed. In the midst of life's storms, we turn unto you. Lord, Please join in singing with us, Eye of a Storm.
This day we invite you to go forth into the world. To know that we're praying for you. Asking that you pray for us. And that we pray together for Christ's church and God's work. So go forth from this place knowing the most powerful thing you can do this day is pray. Amen. I invite you to sing with us our closing song of the blessing.
know that they need you to stay with your family the whole time. We will not be giving hugs. We will not be giving high fives. Your kids and your family need to stay together and we won't be socializing. 